so we're super excited uh, to have uh, Ashish Jackie from Snowflake with us today. So Ashish has been with Snowflake for five years, four years? Five years. Five years. Uh, so they're going to talk about their the, the data warehouse they've been building uh, as part of their startup for the last, last couple of years. I actually interviewed at Snowflake. I had a phone interview with the, the French dudes. That was 2013 before I, I agreed to come to CMU. And I basically told them, like, look, this is very interesting. I'd love to come work with you. If CMU makes me an offer, I'm coming here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, so CMU didn't make me that offer. That's why I went to Snowflake in yeah, <laughs> 2013. So I, I will say that uh, what, I, what I like about any of the semester, <laughs> having our, our friends in industry come talk about their data system, because a lot of the things that I talk about will show up in, again in, in their system. And you'll see how they solve the problems. They may not be exactly all the things that we talked about, because they're working on maybe in different, different operating environments than what we assume. Right? We assume in-memory databases where they're trying to work in a shared disk architecture. So it's good to get another perspective about how people are actually building modern database management systems. OK? OK, go for it. Thanks, Ashish. Awesome. Um, hi, guys. Thanks for having us today. My colleague, Jackie, shout out to him. Uh, <laughs> and I walk while I talk. I can move it. Like maybe, can... maybe that's not a bad idea. Um, like I can do that. That's what you get. Uh, so, uh, so we presented this paper uh, in Sigma 2016. A lot has changed then, since then, but you know the core database has kind of stayed the same. So what I'm here to present today is a a a, a high level, a little more than a high level overview of Snowflake's architecture. Uh, what were some of the design principles? Why did we build it the way we built it? Um, what were the de decisions that we made, and and talk a little bit about what we've done done since then, and then lessons learned, future. Um, so, how many people have read this paper? Oh. Sorry. The, I, I I was hoping that you know everybody in the class will raise their hand. I can close the laptop and walk out of here and say this is great, but it seems like it's the opposite here. So. Um, so let's start from the beginning. Um, Snowflake is an elastic cloud data warehouse. So a data warehouse or an OLAP database is different from an OLTP database <coughs> because we are an analytics database. We scan large amounts of data. We deal with petabytes and petabytes of data as opposed to OLTP systems, which seem to deal with a lot less than that. Uh, so, you know, there are Tons of data warehouses out there. Uh, the, the, you know, Oracle has one. You know, my SQL. I'm sorry, SQL Server has one. Vertica, which he was probably not yeah, really, yeah. never really associated with. Technically, I was an employee of Vertica to make BoltDB. So, okay, sounds good. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Netiza, Teradata. There are tons of databases that existed and have existed for for 30 years uh, or so in this space. Uh, but what changed around uh, the 2000, the, the late 2000s, at least for us, was that the cloud was around, and we, tons of things were coming up on the cloud. And we thought that building a data warehouse on a cloud was a great idea. So we would have a multi-tenant database. Uh, it would be transactional. There are a number of uh, OLAP databases that are non-transactional. Uh, security on the cloud is a big thing, so that would be a key tenant. It would not be an afterthought, but it would be baked in the very beginning for us, uh, and it would be elastic. Um, when uh, so we had a couple of French founders who he mentioned as French dudes, uh, and we had one Polish founder as well. Uh, and uh, so when when they started talking about this, they said, "Oh, you know, the the first thing that every new person would do wanted to build a database, including Peloton." would say, let's take Postgres, let's rip out this thing, and let's put in a new storage layer. And um, we decided not to do that. We decided that it was a lot more effort down the road to deal with the limitations of what Postgres may have in terms of the kinds of plans it may offer, in terms of the catalog it may have. Uh, and so we decided to build it from scratch. There is. There's no Hadoop. There is no other SQL database that is running this. Uh, 
What we did leverage a lot of was the cloud, and I'll talk more about that. It currently runs on AWS and Azure. We have, so I, before I left, I, uh, I looked at our dashboard and we've run two billion queries this year to date. So on one data center or, or one deployment of ours. So we're running close to you know, a few hundred million queries a day, and we have over a thousand customers. Um, I just chime in. So the, the Polish founder, Marcin, he helped build VectorWise. That's right. Which everyone knows here. So, uh, the, yes, and you may have read papers about that in this class. Um, yeah, Ma Marcin was our sort of rock star hire. Um, and <clears throat> so uh, you can, you'll see this as you go. Um, so we picked the cloud, obviously. So. I, uh, Jackie and I both worked at Oracle before this. Um, I worked on this in-memory database, Oracle in-memory. Or, uh, Jackie worked on the query optimizer. And um, I would say that at least 70% of Oracle's code was in the storage layer in the, in, 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 and, and, and everything around that, uh, transactions, et cetera. And maybe 30% was in the query optimizer and other layers about that. So when the cloud came around, we realized that this 70% was actually written for us, or at least most of it was written for us. And we didn't have to do all that much, well, it sounded like all that much work at that time to build the rest of the database since we sort of built databases before. Uh, and that turned out to be true, that we got um, an unlimited supply of compute, and which was elastic. We could demand compute on the fly, and we could relinquish compute on the fly. Uh, and it would give customers uh, a model to pay for what they were using. And they could stop um, and they could relinquish service when they said, oh, I don't need to run any more compute. This was one of the biggest problems that you kind of saw at Oracle or other existing databases that are sort of built and sold for boxes, right? Say, um, you install this, you, you buy a quarter rack of Oracle and you run out of it, and then what do you do? You buy another half rack and it takes you three months to work with it and another three months to plan it and three months of you know, support to move things around and none of that. We didn't want any of that. It needed to be really simple and really elastic. Uh, and it had to be a software as a service. So we, we wanted to be the DBAs. We wanted everybody to sort of, and, and you could sort of see that mind shift and I talk about mind shift and I talk about it a little later, but you could see the mind shift that was moving in analytics is, that people were focusing more on data versus and actually analyzing data than actually having to manage and massage data itself. Uh, so we, 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 we wanted it to be such that there are no knobs, there's nothing for you to really do except for manage, uh, visualize and analyze your data. Right? Uh, so I talked a bit about traditional databases already. Um, they, you, you bought boxes, you bought software licenses, and they were a pain to deal with. So the other thing, and, and this is where I talk about the mind shift, so, uh, where classically how analytics was done in large businesses was you would have a batch job that would run every night and would transfer some amount of data from what is the transaction processing system over to the analytics system. And it would run every night, and your data would be stale, and, and, the, and the results that your dashboards and graphs you'd look at would be stale the next day. But that stopped being true. People were generating a lot more data um, and a lot of different kinds of data and wanted all of that in their database, their OLAP database. So, uh, and in, in addition, there wasn't just structured data that was coming through, there was data coming from Salesforce, and there was data coming from logs that click logs or, or, or what have you. And um, so, and that data was different. It was semi-structured. We'll talk again more about that later. Uh, so to deal with these kinds of the, the, the new mindset for data, of course, there were a lot more solutions that were built. Uh, companies like Google, Facebook, et cetera, went out, built their own systems to deal with the, the data at, at the scale that they were dealing with. And uh, we chose to not use any of the Hadoop-style systems underneath to build our databases, primarily because we thought that they were built for specific use cases that were of much larger scale. 
and, and degraded the performance of the analytics dramatically. Like this, this was when, when, when our first investor actually started talking and he said, uh, he met the French dude and says, you know, guys, uh, you believe you can build a database that's, you know, 100 times faster than Hadoop? And these guys said, of course we can do this, right? And it, it, he couldn't believe them. Right? He said, he says, no, how is that possible? And, and it, so we sort of questioned um, everything that Hadoop was doing for the general populace at that time. What year is this? 2013, 2012? This is maybe mid-20... 12, mid 2012 is when the company started, so it must have taken about six months in the making for this to have happened. But even then, in 2012, a guy was like, Hadoop's great. Right? Like, that was, that was, it was only the decline at that point, right? Like, but this is an investor you're talking about, so he's right. not necessarily that tech savvy, right? But mm -hmm. that's not true completely. But uh, uh, I mean, I, I would say 2012, to, to build a da cloud database in 2012 was still not a given, right? And if you, I was on the job market in 2013, end of 2012, and and it you could easily pick a dozen companies that were doing Hadoop-based solutions, and only one company that wanted to talk about doing a, a, a native a native database from scratch, right? So that kind of gave you the the uh, maybe two uh, the spread. So. Um, the 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 other thing that these these solutions lack, and this kind of refers to that, is the, there was a lot more focused on building on on building building processing frameworks, but a lot less focus on building manageability, security. How do you? So they weren't really built for an enterprise that didn't want to have all this IT burden. Or and you you if you wanted to hire and build a Hadoop team with fifteen people like you guys, then Go for it, but if you didn't want to do that, there was nothing out there. Um, so our vision was a, a straight data warehouse as a service with SQL as your front end, um, no knobs, no infrastructure that you had to deal with, and and elasticity that is multi-dimensional, which you'll see in a little bit. I'll talk a little bit more about this, and support for all kinds of data. Um, so we, you know, so the reason why this slide kind of exists is because we had to sort of compare and contrast ourselves with some of, some of our competitors, and 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 we talked about this. The, the, so there, there are these two classic modes where there the shared nothing databases and there the shared disk databases, um, and one of the problems and that we're sort of seeing is with shared nothing architectures was people really like them, me included back then. Uh, but they came with a huge set of problems with local storage. They seem very logical. They seem great. You saying, yes, you know, I could do. A, I have to do a join. I can do this locally. I will do my local join locally, and then I will deal with the join uh, on non-primary keys outside of that. Um, and maybe I won't deal with it very well. But as soon as you uh, separated uh, or you co-located the compute and the storage you ran into issues when you, had, you needed more capacity. Or when you needed to, you were running some background work and now you have to manage uh, uh, how to, to, to schedule work on this. Or when you had to say, I've run out of storage, I need to add two new servers, I need to redistribute the data, right? Uh, so, and this was the dominant architecture. Uh, Oracle is the one that sort of didn't exactly do this, but everybody else was doing this. And um, so the, you know, for some of the marketing slides, we have this picture of, uh, I don't know how many of you used to read this cartoon called Asterix and Obelisk. Uh, and well, maybe it's a little lost, but uh, it's, it's basically, European, right? yeah, uh, or, or, or South Asian. Uh, but anyways, it's it's there's, there's a real fight for resources on these systems, and to to deal with those resources, you want to separate the compute and storage, uh, uh, and that was one of the tenets that Snowflake had to begin with. Uh, this also talks about problems when you lose copies, uh, when you lose some set of servers, as you can imagine, you would lose data 
there are ways systems work around these with multiple copies of data, though not that much in SQL really. Um, like, uh, anyways, uh, so this is uh, one of our stock slides, and it kind of highlights what the multi-cluster and shared data architecture is. So, so there's the data that sits in the center uh, here, which is on a, 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 a service like S3, for example. And uh, it could be various formats can be ingested into this. We turn all of these into our proprietary format. It's called FDN, uh, which means snowflake in French, uh, fleur de neige. Uh, and then what you do is you provision a set of clusters or, or a, a set of servers or a cluster, what we call a warehouse, a virtual warehouse, and you can run queries through this warehouse on this data. And this data is fetched from S3 and brought here for the purpose of the query. When you're done querying this data, you can return it, right? Um, so you're not paying for anything other than the compute that you used plus the storage, which is much cheaper, dramatically cheaper on all cloud solutions. Uh, you can run one user, you can run multiple users. Uh, you can also have different clusters for different kinds of workloads, where you say, and this has been a huge problem traditionally, where you say, look, I have got only so much CPU to for my ETL jobs. Now, ETL is this process which takes the data from various other sources and pushes it into um, this OLAP database. Uh, it's called extract, transform, load, just in case. Uh, effectively, ingestion of data. And, and you can separate that. You can have separate data for your QA and test environment. So what we also said was that you can take some of this data and you can make a copy of it. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but bear with me for a second. So that's a feature called clone, and I'll talk about that. But, and you can separate, have separate things for dashboards. You can, different business units can do different things. This worked really well for customers. Uh, it, was, it was really convincing that, oh, I don't, and, and you, 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 you sort of see people smile, say, I don't have to go fight with this department or that department to do this. Uh, and what we also did on top is then we said, aha, there are other data science solutions that exist, like Spark. Uh, we need to be able to connect with more than just SQL. We need to have uh, dashboards like Tableau, um, Click, and, and Spark, which does data processing. So we build connectors for other things. And fortunately, we now sort of grown to the stage where other people build connectors for us too. Um, the one thing that I haven't mentioned here is, so, so the life of a query is sort of that it, it comes in, um, and maybe that's actually better explained on the next slide, but uh, there is a large amount of metadata component here. Uh, and while the data that's stored on S3 or is on the blob storage is stored, uh, is, 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 is this set of immutable files, all the other catalog information, all the other account uh, accounts, users, sessions, billing, what a SQL statement is, what are the set of changes for a transaction that it's made, are all really stored in metadata, which is a separate system and is available to all the services on this warehouse, right? And uh, that allows us to sort of efficiently do something called a clone, which I will, uh, talk about it again in a bit. But so you got no data silos. Data was available to each one of these. Data got moved from S3, got cached on these clusters. So it was, while it was shared disk at this point, it also had the advantage of being shared nothing, right? So this workload was a loading workload and could load a subset of data that was valuable to it, whereas this Tableau user, a dashboarding tool user, could load a subset of data that he was analyzing or she was analyzing. Whereas the QA department could do something completely different. Right? Uh, and so we actually get really good uh, cache locality. So we get really close to the shared, nothing like cache locality on these warehouses, whereas all the data is still here. So it's a 
the I'm curious to support Spark. Is there like a generic JDBC connector for Spark, or is there something specific yet array for Snowflake? So our first version was a generic JDBC connector, maybe our 0.1 version. But then we do a lot more. We do push down of um, predicates, and uh, and we need to do a lot more. Um, that's all on like, the, the connector side. Yeah. That's all on the connector side. So that's. Um, uh, that's a very important piece for us. So, we, so, so what, what shows up at Snowflake from Spark? Is it SQL or is it some... some... SQL. Okay. Yeah. That's still the interface. Okay. Uh, whether we will do anything beyond SQL, that's kind of uh, a question that's yet to be answered. Uh, I mean, you could sort of imagine more things, but we haven't really... We, that, that's something that's... Some people believe in, some people don't believe in. Um, Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a better view of the architecture. And so the cloud services, uh, which are common to everybody, right? So the, uh, are manage everything other than the execution of the query itself, right? So when you first create a Snowflake account, you really have to do nothing. So you've created an account. All we've done is we've created an account and an entry for you in the metadata, right? You, you log in, you provision a warehouse, like so, and then you execute a query, which goes through, you, so the login, of course, goes through authentication access control, stores your session information in the metadata. Um, you provision a warehouse, which goes to the infrastructure manager and says, I'm going to go to Amazon get you four servers, right? Uh, you execute a query, which then sends a request to the optimizer, uh, compiles the query, produces a plan, and this virtual warehouse is polling this service to see whether it can execute this plan or not. I mean, is there work for it to do or not? All the nodes or, 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 or servers in this particular warehouse will fetch the same plan and will execute it and they will return the result. They actually write down the, they write the result on S3 as well. Uh, but, and then the client can actually pull the result and get it directly, right? So, uh, uh, but that's really the life of a query, right? And what the, the, so what you get here is a virtual, a, a set of workers who are completely stateless, right? They, they know that they've been given a plan. Uh, they get a set of files from here, which they're, they're told that these are a set of files you need to read, partitions as we call them. Um, and they cache them locally. So the cache is probably the only piece of state that we have. And, and when that query is done, they go and ask if there's more work to do, another query to execute, right? Um, but you dump, you write the intermediate results to S3, and then something is following that location to see whether it exists, like the data is ready, and then, and then pull it in? And by intermediate results, you mean for a single query? Yes. Uh, we do write intermediate results, but there's nothing that's pulling. The query has to continue to execute. There's no, I can kill this query and make it restart at the same point later in life. But say, say I'm doing, uh, okay. Let's say you exploded your join. Yeah. Right? and you ended up spilling to the local cashier and maybe then to S3. Uh, at that point, that, if that query failed, then all the intermediate results are lost. But it, I mean, is it like, there's like an exchange operator that's waiting for the results from all of its children? Correct. So, 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 the, so we, we'll get in a little bit into the plan and what kind of plan it is, but uh, that's, hold, hold that for a second, okay. right? Uh, so we start from the bottom. I don't know why that doesn't show up very well, but uh, uh, fair enough. Uh, we start from the bottom. Uh, the storage layer, as you know, is, is S3. It, um, for, for Amazon, whatever the cloud storage is for Azure, but it, it's built of immutable files. And this was something that was kind of forced on us and turned out to be one of the, a huge blessing for us. Um, with immutable files, you, it, was, it made it a lot easier to cache them at these various tiered levels of caching that we have on ephemeral disk as well as uh, in memory when you're executing the plan. Uh, but 
it also made transaction snapshot isolation much easier, right? Uh, so S3 is, of course, highly available. The performance is not that good, but we solved that problem by making sure that there's local caching, right? Uh, so this is how a micropartition looks for us. It's, uh, it's a fairly well-known format. It's called PAX, uh, which is called a hybrid columnar. I don't know if you read this paper, but it cover it somewhere. But what it means is that each column is stored separately uh, within the same file, one after the other. There are offsets to each column. And within each column, um, we do various kinds of compression, depending on the type uh, for that column. So for example, for, um, for, for uh, numbers, we do Bayes encoding. For strings, we do tries and dictionary encoding. For uh, JSON, we have a fancy try as well. Uh, and so each of the, they're roughly 16 megabytes in size, some are a little larger. And there is a header which points to each column, so you don't have to fetch the entire file, you can fetch part of a file, which makes, again, uh, fortunately, this is, a, this is also something that S3 supported, otherwise we'd have to probably split this into multiple files. So you can sort of seek in and, and read uh, a, a, a few blocks. So um, we've talked about other data. I briefly mentioned that we store our, uh, our data also, uh, the, the results of a query also in S3. And this really helped us, for example, if I did select star from T on a one billion row table, it happens. Customers do this all the time, not expecting anything, and, and or with, with even maybe some small predicate. What do you do at that point? Most databases would croak with this, right? Uh, what we do is we simply push those results to S3, and we return the first block to the client. And now the client kind of, and the result kind of knows what the next set of blocks are. It's got a manifest and it can fetch the rest of the results. Not only was this useful for results, but if this format of your results is something that you can query yourself, which we can, uh, then you can now enable a feature like querying on your own results, right? And uh, so features like, some of these features were enabled by metadata and storage, which classic databases just, are just unable to do. Uh, at least not do, do very easily. Uh, I mentioned uh, our metadata store. This is a big part of our story. So uh, we, we used to store everything that was not data in that system. So all our objects, all our catalogs, zone maps. I uh, assume you guys are familiar with zone maps. Um, and even transactions, they're not done by the workers themselves. The transactions need to be done at the global level if you've got multiple clusters, because one, the work of one cluster can interfere with the work of another, right? And a, as a result, uh, you know, a lock queue was sort of implemented as part within this metadata store. Is there a foundation DB in this case? Right, so uh, the metadata store is foundation DB, um, and it, recently went open source, so we're very happy again. Um, so you, you charge, like, you charge, like, actually, what, what is the pricing model? Like, you charge for storage, that makes sense, because it's, it's there, because they gotta pay for it, and then you charge on the compute side of the query. That's it. And you don't charge for the data transfer? No. We assume, we assume that's noise, and it is. Uh, so we put... Uh, oh, because you dump everything to S3, so they're going to get charged with that, and they pull it out, and it's not got it. <laughs> I mean, so we, we don't charge any premium on, on, the, on the storage itself. We just, it's a pass-through cost for us. And we believe that by charging a premium for the service, uh, you should be able to cover the rest of the cost. Otherwise, it's just a very complicated pricing model. Um, and it just becomes like, you know, you have to check through various menu items to say it's this, 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 and uh, in fact, we don't even charge the results uh, or storing the results. We just, it, it's something we can deal with. Uh, so 
we, we talked about this. The other thing we sort of did was that we hid what warehouses were really uh, in terms of size and resources. So you, you, you basically order a t-shirt and say it's X small or it's 4X large or 2X large, which really is a multiple of two uh, in terms of the compute resources that you get. And this allows us to change the instance types that we may use in the future as well. Um, so let me, let me pause for a second and see if there are any questions. Have I lost anybody here? Uh, and I'll get a sip of water in as well. So the one thing uh, I haven't mentioned yet is how these sort of workers get a set of partitions to, uh, to work with. And so when the query comes in, the compiler determines from uh, the metadata which set of micro partitions belong to a table. Uh, it does what's called as pruning uh, and using the zone maps removes number of micro partitions and then it consistent hashes uh, those micro partitions onto the nodes of a virtual warehouse, right? And is, it does this because you expect the same workload to come through and the caches on the virtual warehouse to work effectively. Um, what you'll often find is that resources in the cloud are flaky. Uh, servers can sometimes have poor I.O. performance or, or are just running degraded because you're actually sharing resources with others. And um, so you need to deal with stragglers. And this is, this is a very typical problem in, in, in query processing. You'll find this that, you know, eight out of your nine pipelines or, you know, seven out of your eight pipelines are actually done, but the eighth one is kind of stuck and, and it slows down the entire query uh, because you had to wait for that one to finish. Uh, and so what we did was we added this concept of stealing. It's, it's not super fancy. I mean, I think it's not super fancy, but uh, the French dudes disagree with me. But uh, what we did is we also consistent hash that part of the stealing. So it's like, if you can think of it as another round of consistent hashing, or it, it, it effectively gives you deterministic stealing so that you increase your chances. If, if, if one specific node is consistently slow, then other no, uh, the node that would still work would do it deterministically. And this is, this is for the case of scans, but it's also true for ingesting external data, right? What is, what, what is usually the, the main cause of like the slow, like if, if the data is highly skewed, even if you steal the work, it's still gonna take, you know, it's not magic if you go faster, you still have to scan all the work. That's all you know, that well, you still have to scan all the work, that's right. But you're running on a, a node which is on a rack where some other company is also running something and has saturated the network, right? So all of a sudden your network to S3 is terrible. So you're screwed. Um, so we've moved to, we, I mean, we moved from the storage in the last slide to the, to, to, to the execution engine. And here this kind of gets into uh, more of the weeds and the kind of stuff that you've been talking about in this class. Uh, um, so uh, we're columnar, as, as we said, and uh, our founder, the third founder, Marcin Zhukovsky, was one of the guys who worked at Vectorize, uh, Vectorwise, and was one of the pioneers of vectorization and for databases. So, you know, it was, it was very clear to us that we had to vectorize this and uh, we had to, so our use of SIMD instructions of vectorization was kind of done on day one. We kind of knew what we wanted to start it with. Our use of what we call as, you know, selection vectors and, you know, you don't materialize intermediate results uh, when you're, say, filtering. So you sort of maintain what are the sort of, what are the particular rows that you've picked. Uh, was these are some of the decisions that we kind of made very early on. Uh, this, what we also decided that we would do a push-based operator, a push-based model, unlike a lot of databases that 
where sort of these volcano style, including Oracle, uh, uh, which are iterator based. And this was, I think, uh, fairly prevalent by the time we had started working in this space. I think it was quite clear that all future databases should be written this way. And, 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 and so, I mean, this debate for, you know, whether you have a push-based query execution model or a pull-based is a fairly old one. It's, it's, uh, I mean, this paper from Neumann made it quite popular, but uh, made, uh, was a good paper. But so what we do is we uh, we we operate on blocks of data or or, or on rows or, or what are called as batches of data, and the plan sort of moves from down upwards if you visualize a, a plan, but they're really called downstream operators. So at a time there's a set there's a, there's a set of operators at at this level at at each level that is sort of executing and sending data to each other, and once they're done, then they move on forward. That's kind of changed and improved over, over, over time. But uh, what this meant was that we could also have plans that were not just trees, and they were DAGs. Uh, so your plan could sort of fork your data and, and, and merge back up later. Uh, and this was very helpful. So for example, our update is really because we're dealing with immutable data, if you decide to modify a single row of a table, you had to take that partition, micro partition, you had to read the entire partition, write everything other than that row back, and that row again with the modified data, right? So you can sort of imagine that there, there are two kinds of, uh, there, are two, there, there are two pipelines, right? So you can say all the data that sort of needs to be updated goes on one pipeline and all the data that doesn't need to be modified goes on the other pipeline. But you can do this as part of your scan operator and you can split it at that point, right? And, and, and so these DAG-shaped plans actually ended up being quite powerful for us. And without the push-based approach, I think we couldn't have done the DAG-shaped uh, plans either. Um, so, you seem to have a quizzical look, do you? I'm missing the update part. Like, I, I don't understand the, the splitting. So, you have an update yeah. statement which modifies one row in a partition, right? Now, we have to create a brand new partition with all the rows except for that one row, which are the same, but this one row needs the update. Right, so what do you do? You 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 do you, you scan this twice, or you create some intermediate results, or you say that I'm going to have two sets of operators run on the scan data. So if I pivot based on saying if this row needs to be modified, then it needs to go to this operator, which will just write it in and produce a new partition, a new file. If it doesn't need to be modified then it, it goes on this other part, side of the partition. And it, this, uh, these DAG graphs ended up, we, we, used, we ended up using these for, for view merging also. Right, Jackie? Yeah. Uh, right. So <clears throat> there is no buffer pool. We realized that uh, um, I mean, again, this was not new information at that time, but that putting sort of reserving large amounts of memory for partitions in, in, in um, or micro partitions in memory was not as valuable as actually giving the higher operators more memory, right? And go ahead. So if we need to scan all you for the data, then it's not going to be changed. You just like, <coughs> Another operator, and so, so you're creating like another copy which only contains like the data modified. Correct. So we would send the data on one link, and we would send the data a different data, possibly on another link. Yeah, for the zone change, what would another like the other link be? So, are, are, are so there... one link says modify the data that's come in here. The, this link says don't have to modify it. This is as is, and it's it's what we call a scan back, in fact. Yeah. 
Uh, you end up having like two copies, and the other one is like new copy, which only like modified copy, for example. And then you merge this back, and you produce a new file. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's right. There is the, the, the there is no buffer pool, and we'll talk a little bit more about our memory management uh, in one of the slides. There's a design slide. I think it's coming up pretty soon. It's, it, that's it. This is this one, uh, and this kind of uh, it, it talks a little bit about how Peloton is thinking about its model as well about its its self driving. I, I can't say we're self driving in the same sense that Peloton is. But to operate at the scale that we are, we're definitely self-tuning, and we're definitely adaptive. So uh, uh, for example, we do automatic memory management, which says that how much memory an operator uses is, is sort of a little adaptive. So the compiler kind of decides how much memory it should get. But the operator tries to use as much memory as possible in the beginning. Right? And then the operator can scale down if it needs to, because another query came in and you needed to do workload uh, workload management. So, and this this so what you want is if you've got a single query running on a, a warehouse or a set of nodes, you want to take all the resources that are available to finish as fast as possible. Right? Now, if another query comes in, then you say, oh shit, what do I do? I've got to split this in, into two. Right? So the operators can can grow and shrink their memory uh, based on the situation. Uh, we pick the degree of parallelism based on what we see. Uh, so if you say, "Oh, this is a really simple query," we believe it it, it it's got only it needs to scan eight partitions. Uh, that's eight files. Then I think it can run on a single process. It doesn't really need. Uh, eight nodes, then uh, we change that on the fly. <coughs> Memory part, sorry, I need to back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I'm uh, getting ready to appear. I think the beginning is that the compiler could decide on a memory operator to take or something like that. What do, what do you mean by that? So the compiler needs to come up with some decision. Is it not the to... query optimizer? Is some com compiler? The compiler and query optimizer are the same thing. Oh, okay. they're, they're, they're synonyms for, yeah, that, for us. It comes up with an estimation, but you don't really use it. You still give the operator whatever memory you have. So, so memory is more for scheduling how many queries to run on the warehouse to begin with. It's used by a warehouse query scheduler. Uh, and to decide what the degree of parallelism should be. Okay, but once you decide it, you give all resources to the query. You, have, you give all the resources to the queries that are available. Or you split them evenly oh, even. okay. across the queries that exist. Okay. Right. I mean, there is there is a little bit of fudge factor, and there is a little bit of nuances there, but that's the high order bit. Is that you? Um, and why would you not? Because you have so many resources that are available, and you want your query to finish as fast as possible. In fact, if if your queries, and this is one thing we kind of tell all our customers as well, that if you find that your queries are scaling linearly, then use the largest warehouse you can. Right. Cool. Right, right, but it's just kind of interesting to me that you use the memory estimation to decide how many queries to run, but you don't use that to distribute different different sides of memory to different queries or different operators. You that's and that's right, and and you'll see that that's one of our ethos. Is you'll find our our general belief is that the query optimizer can be wrong, and when it is wrong, it can be it's horribly wrong, sure. and so you use it to get some sense of how things should work. But then you don't rely on it at runtime. So at runtime, you make adaptive decisions on the fly. Fair enough. At what granularity are you, are you, are you like adjusting things? Like, is it like per vector as you process to say, all right, what, how much memory should, be, should I go up or down? It's per operator. Okay. So each operator has a budget for memory and that budget is shrunk, or uh, and and the operators are actually monitoring the system themselves. So you say, hey, this is how much memory is actually available on the system, and so I need to degrade and back off yeah, so, so what, exponentially. What granularity is it? Like, is it polling and checking? Should I back off? 
we change this. I would say it's like off the order of a few milliseconds. Is that what you're kind of going yeah, after? Yeah. Like I would say hundreds of milliseconds, right? Yeah, I think it's more for the Also, it depends on the operator. Can actually do it or not. If it's a hash, if you're building a hash table for a hash domain, you don't want to shrink it back. You have to then hash it back, right? Like, or spill to disk. Oh, ah, okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, there is no vacuuming. There are no statistics. The only thing we use are zone maps. Uh, at this level, there is nothing else that the uh, uh, that the execution engine is using to to decide what to do different. Um, so how do you pick the join order then? It's picked for you already. <clears throat> By who? By the compiler. So how, 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 is, how, how is it picking? It, 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 it's picked it based on what plan it came up with. So that join order is not yet adaptive. Got it, okay. Um, it can be. Sure, yeah. Um, I also saw other things, if you don't mind. I also saw some automatic distribution. So I will, I will this next example is a much better way of doing this. And <laughs> so these two slides are actually I pulled up from marketing. So they're a tad bit repetitive, but uh, I, I like how they kind of covered the picture. Uh, so th this is an example of uh, a, a, a join. And what we do is we detect the popular values on say a build side of the join, which for us is the in this case is whatever, uh, the left side of the join. And, and if there are a lot of popular values, then we will, of, of one type, say we're in Pennsylvania and your ticketing system has Pennsylvania 99 out of 100 times, then we want to broadcast that value as part of a join. Uh, for all the other values, we want to hash distribute them. So at runtime, we can make this decision. The compiler does not make this decision at all, right? Uh, so, <clears throat> so we sample it, uh, we get the number of values. We believe there is, I mean, as such, there is no performance degradation because we can make this decision on the fly. And it wasn't decided that, so, I mean, uh, uh, this isn't a new technique per se, but it wasn't sort of predetermined that you will do hash, or you will do broadcast, or you will do adaptive. It is always adaptive, it's always on. Otherwise, you sort of have to tweak and tune every query, which just isn't feasible. Right? Uh, so we've now moved to the top layer. I can pause again, uh, take a few questions. I, am, I think I'm doing okay on time. Uh, I think I've got about another 15 minutes and then maybe another few yeah. minutes uh, for questions. Uh. Yeah, we That's right, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so the cloud service is what we sort of call the brains of the system. That's, the, that's what you saw was the compiler, optimizer, uh, transactions metadata layer, and the access control. This is the only part that is multi-tenant. Everything else, as you noticed, is, is not multi-tenant. It's also highly available, so we can we run this across different parts and, uh, of the Amazon data center. They call availability zones, so if one center is unavailable or has reduced um, availability, we can switch over to the other. Uh, when we started out, uh, building Snowflake, we actually thought that this would be the easy part and the database would be a hard part. It turns out it's the opposite. Um, there's a lot more work to do over here than, I, I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of work everywhere, but it turns out that we, it, it took us a lot more work to get this right and get this working. It's, it's, you know, you sort of, I give this analogy when I talk to people is, this service needs to be online 24 seven all the time, needs to work for online upgrades it's like you've got a dance floor and you know, you've got all these people who are dancing on it and, and every week you need to build a new dance floor and you need to move the dance floor under all the dancers without making them, without them knowing it or them stop dancing, right? Uh, and this is effectively what 
we do as part of the service. So uh, um, this talks a bit about our transaction uh, model. Um, as I mentioned, it, our transactions are completely done as part of metadata. And we implement snapshot isolation. It turns out that this immutable S3 uh, files that we have make life much easier. You effect, what you need to do is effectively keep track of the set of files that belong to a table at a point in time, which is after every DML operation that took place. And once these, if, if another DML takes place, then you sort of keep track of the set of files that were added or removed, partitions that are added or removed, right? And instead of now maintaining an AD style, you know, a, a redo log or an undo log, you all you need to keep track of is the set of file operations that were that you have to undo or redo if you did a commit right so you sort of keep these on all on the side and say aha i want to commit then you say make these files part of the set of the table and if you said rollback then you said let's just throw them away uh, now you can sort of also imagine that if we kept track of the set of files or various points in time, then we can do what we call as time travel. Uh, it, is, it is a feature that some other databases also have, but it's really easy for us to say, these were the set of files one day ago. We can, you can run your query on this one day ago or 30 days ago, right? All you're incurring is extra storage cost, right? What, is there a customer UK use case that you can think of as like the that involves time travel queries. Because I know one, and it's the only one I ever hear about. Um, there was uh, a systems integrator who came and showed us once a, a dashboard that was live, and they had implemented it with time travel, and he would move the slider back and forth, and the graph would change completely, and it was making time travel queries to see, aha, this is how it was, and this is how it was. Uh, and that's, that's been one use case. I know it's used quite heavily. Uh, a lot of people use it to see what changes have taken place in their table. Um, like this is what the table was back then, this is what it was, you know, I can do. Uh, and other than that, people also use it to make copies of their data. So you say, I want to create a clone of the data as of seven days ago, right? So I think these are the large use cases that kind of exist. And, I mean, so what, like, what vertical is that usually common in? What vertical is that common in? Um, so the financial guys I know had to do that a lot. The financial guys have, I mean, I would say they have like a slightly different set of requirements, they but, be, uh, and, and their sort of requirements may sort of go beyond like, you know, seven days or 30 days or one year. And I, 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 I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I don't think I've dealt with enough customers, Jackie. That. Sure. And how do you handle like time travel on like schema changes? Like, do do, do you record the schema history, the schema version history, so that like if someone drops a column now, and I want to do a time travel query in the past, I don't want to lose like that column to still show up. So we don't version our schema today the same way as time travel does. Okay. So you're a bit out of luck there and you, um, you could run into some situations where you're not able to, let's say you um, dropped a column, then you may not be able to access it at that point in time, on past point in time. Does it mean like you cannot go back to like seven days ago without the column or you can go but like without the compiler won't let you right uh, the data the data that. the partitions in the data is there the compiler says this is the this is the table how do i go access the, this whole thing right <clears throat> um so i also talk about cloning here i don't know i i, I briefly mentioned this i said i'd talk about it later but you can sort of imagine that Cloning an object is much easier. All you have to do is make a copy of the metadata that points to the underlying data, and then these objects can evolve independently. 
the, this is one of the other uh, sort of key contributions uh, that Snowflake has um, for the product is, is our zone map implementation. Since our zone maps are also part of metadata, the compiler itself can do a lot of work itself. So for example, you can run a, a number of queries that can be answered completely from metadata. I select star or select max C1 from T, you don't have to go to the execution engine at all, right? Because the compiler looks at the zone maps, it says, aha, I'm just going to scan the zone maps. This one is the largest one. I'm going to return that result. Uh, what we also did is we implemented a lot of operators. I think pretty much every operator that exists works with the zone maps and you can derive the values of what the zone maps would be for every partition. So every partition has a zone map which says what the min value is, what the max value is, what the number of distinct value is, but let's let's just look at the min and max value. And if you've got a, let's take a substring, substring is a bad example, but, uh, uh, but if you had, let's say, a date trunk function, and then we would apply the date truncation even on the zone maps. So we kind of implemented our, you know, evaluation of, of expressions, both in the compiler as well as in the execution. And it, it gets a little trickier here because our compiler is written in Java, whereas our execution engine is written in C++. So we had to make sure that we worked hard that their behavior is kind of the same. So, so the zone map, is, is the zone map solely used by the offminder or, or the compiler? Mm -hmm. The executor never referenced zone map to help its execution? By the time the execution has received uh, the plan, it either includes the values of the zone map that are interesting to it, or nine out of 10 times it doesn't need them at all because the set of files that the execution needs to scan have been determined. So for joint pruning, for example, we include the zone map as part of the zone map for the set of files that we already picked as part of the execution plan. Is it saying, like, after some queries, you can, like, uh, basically get the results without touching the base data? Mm -hmm. Basically, if you can, if there's a, if there's any expression in the query that can be evaluated to a constant, then your problem is solved, yeah. right? Like, From the zone maps. Like, except for those functional like substring. Right. So, I mean, you may be able to do substring also. I'm not saying it's not possible, but in general, it's a bad example because. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Uh, the zone maps are hanging out in memory, so at this point you're running in memory speed. You're running in memory speed. Mm -hmm. um, so our zone maps used to be in Foundation DB. We've since moved them out of Foundation DB to uh, they store it in separate files in S3. We load them from there as well. But are you also like storing zone maps on the disk? Yes, on S3. They cache them in memory. They cache them in memory. So if you run a query which says uh, you know, select C1 from T, where C2 greater than 5, then we will load the zone map for C2. Um, is the entire cloud service written in Java? I'm wondering, like, if you wrote everything from scratch, why are you using Java and then C++? Only the brain is written in Java. The muscle is all written in C++. Could you remind me what the brain is? <laughs> the, the brain is the cloud services on the top, uh -oh. which is the compiler. The, the, the metadata manager, oh. the access control, security, transactions. The muscle is the virtual warehouses, the set of workers which are actually executing the plan. Right? So um, the, the thought process was that to build a RESTful service with a, with a cloud service, there are a lot more libraries that are available to use in Java. And that was kind of true at that point. Um, I mean, if we would... It's still true now, but it's, it's, I would say that there are enough cloud services that have been built using C++ only. And I don't know, if we've, 
you know, we've, we've had our fair share of issues and concerns with, with Java. If I would guarantee you that if we just sort of read it this, we would probably not pick Java for the brain either. Well, would it be better in performance if we use the blocks? Can I take it this way? Uh, we use Java for like... So you've, you've got to realize, right, that the bulk of the time in, for all our queries is spent on the worker nodes in the C++ code, oh, yeah. right? When you, when you have queries that are running for, you know, a minute or even two or three seconds, then All the is, is done down there. Yeah. And whatever work is done in the Java layer is of hopefully of the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Right? Now, that's not always true uh, because sort of evaluating these things and dealing with zone maps can take time. Uh, sort of if you get really large complex query plans with you know, thousands or tens of thousands of operators, then transforming these plans can also take time. Um, how do you determine the number of zones? It's predetermined for us because every partition that was ingested has a zone map. So it's the partition. Is so, for example, we determine the size exactly. We determine the size of a partition. It's a few megabytes, okay. tens of megabytes, and that partition for every partition we have that. Okay. Right. You haven't taken a database class, have you? <sighs> I don't remember why. Yeah. <laughs> you have <to> take mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we also maintain bloom filters on top of this. Uh, we, we kind of stopped doing that for some things because our bloom filters and it just ended up being too large. We found they were not that effective. Uh, at some point, we had to sort of revisit this. But we use bloom filters for other things, um, including joins. And has got a better one. We told you, right? Yeah, we, we talked talk about that. Uh, so, so the one thing I didn't mention is that we don't have indexes, no indexes at all. There's no, right? And uh, this is not uncommon. If you have a billion rows, you can have an index. If you have a trillion rows, maintaining indexes is a lot more painful. At that point, you're much better off saying, I will create another table, which is effectively an index table. Right? Uh, we built a UI, like, and I was shocked when we started doing this, and I was like, why would we do this? Uh, and I think this is one of the best decisions we ever made. Uh, it's, 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 full, it's, it's a full-fledged, it's almost like an ID in some sense. And a lot of customers, for them, that is pretty much the database. Uh, it allows them to easily do a lot of operations that were much harder to do through command line. Right, so you say access control, creation of new users, etc. This, this SQL for all of this, but uh, running, this, doing this on the UI, managing how many warehouses there are, how, how do I see this? How, what is, what is my billing? How, how well are my warehouses utilized? Is, is all possible really through the UI? The, the other thing that we kind of did um, is that, so performance while we wanted to make sure that our first cut was super good. We wanted to make sure that we could analyze our performance really well. So uh, stuff like sampling of what the operators were doing, which operators were running, running, how much time did each operator take, uh, was done on day one. And we not only that, we would actually get metrics for all of this back to the brain from the stateless workers. And we would show all these metrics for every query. Right, so the kind of things that Oracle added, you know, in 2008, were sort of there on day one. And whenever a customer has a, a has a problem with a query, our you know people from support are sort of able to look at this and say, by the way, it seems like you know this is where your join is exploding. This is how how many rows went up here. This operator took so long. Uh, it's it's really easy and it's really important to be able to do this at the scale that we are. And, and we're reaping the benefits of that today. Right? Um, there was focus on ease of use, no, no knobs to tune, uh, no physical design, no storage to groom, no storage to manage. Right? Uh, There's no view either? There are views. Okay, it's just that you don't really like that, but okay. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. 
there, the, we, we've had views before we went generally available. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the future features that are coming up. Uh, I mean, in terms of SQL support, we are probably up there or way up there as compared to most other databases. In fact, uh, we, we even support dialects of other, of multiple databases just to make sure that it's easy for them to move over. Which ones? Like or like MySQL Postgres stuff? Uh, Oracle, NetEase, Teradata, some of. NetEase is Postgres anyway, so like. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you know, there's stuff like, you know, bind types, for example. That's the easy one, but. Uh, uh, what did you start with as your SQL grammar? Did you take, like, the Postgres one and then build, build that off of that or scratch? We started with our own. We, we wrote our own, we used Antler. Yeah. Uh, we when we when I said we started from scratch, we started literally everything from scratch, and and so we call our grammar Frankenstein grammar. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, that's what you call it a term. Like the marketing people don't call it that, certainly. <laughs> it's Frankenstein because it's got a bit of everything mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, we talked a bit about this. We we're continuously available. And our, our points of failure are not uh, our own, but they're sort of external services, right? So when you think about it, there's there probably a, today on say US West, there's probably a thousand brains running and there's probably, you know, 5,000 workers running, uh, each one running multiple processes. And, and none of these, not, not a, a failure of a single one should not bring the system down, never, right? Uh, so, um, semi-structured data, I'm running a little behind, I'm gonna try, try to go a little faster here. We, we, we realized we needed first class support for this and we, we did a fantastic job at this. This is one of our huge differentiators. I don't think there is any other database that has as good uh, JSON support as we do. And it works. Uh, so we added three new types. We didn't call it JSON because we wanted to ingest um, Avro or BSON or what have you. So we call it a variant, which is effect. You can think of it as JSON, and then a map and an array, a list or a map, which is an object is really a map, right? Uh, and we supported all SQL operators on this. So you can you can do joins on it. You can do group buys on it. You can even flatten it, which is you can take the multiple sort of array values or map attributes that were there and turn it into individual rows. And there's this concept in databases, which is which are called as lateral joins. Um, I um, that, but yeah. And I understand. Uh, and, and that's effectively what we use, but. Uh, so uh, there are a number of other people who did this, but they required schema definition up front. We have absolutely no schema definition. You can evolve this over time. Each partition can have its schema. We will columnarize what are the most common paths in this. So you get native performance on those paths. Right? And this was, this, this, this was a key uh, differentiator for us. So for example, if you've got, you know, uh, you know, property like, you know, courses um, and 721 is this value, but if, if, if you know, cmu.courses shows up in every single row, then we will turn that into a full-fledged column under the covers. Yeah, I mean, this is if you're given JSON, or if you have a CSV, that yeah. has a schema. This is only for semi-structured data. Right, because everything else is already structured and already columnized. And not only that, for everything that we will columnize, we'll also produce zone maps. And hence we get performance that's as good as uh, a native column. I think Vertica does this too, right? Possibly. Uh, so that's a little fancy picture. We turn things columnar and this was, we, we usually don't push out a lot of benchmarks that 
gets us into trouble or could get us into trouble. But uh, this is an example of how the TPCH performs with and without JSON. Or if, if you turn it completely in JSON data. And you can see it's pretty similar. Uh, this is less interesting. Um, we talked about time travel and cloning. I, I'll talk about security very briefly. Uh, so we encrypt all our data at rest. This was um, obviously a given for us uh, that we were in the cloud. A number of customers are very sensitive to moving into the cloud, and we had to prove to them that we would be way more secure than what they could ever be, right? And, and we, we did a fantastic job. Uh, security, again, was something that we, wasn't an afterthought for us. It, it happened on day one. And so uh, we, we introduced role-based security very early on. In, in fact, we went GA with this, right? Which is to say that fine-grained access was controlled by various roles which could be granted to, 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 to users, and then various accesses could be granted to those roles. Right, so again, there was a little indirection by introducing roles. So privileges and roles are two separate things. Right? Uh, we made sure we had stuff like two-factor authentication. Uh, our, key sp our key management for, is such that it's hierarchical. So we, we, Snowflake can have a customer managed key, which is in the customer's own KMS or whatever they have, key management system. And to decrypt the data, the customer would have to provide us that key because we ourselves cannot read it otherwise, right? And that key is sort of encapsulated with if it's Snowflake's own key, which is different than for each database, it's different for a schema, it's different for tables, and each set of files, we generate new set of keys. So if you sort of manage to crack one key, you won't be able to still crack or read the other files. Uh, we also change these keys and we rotate them, and so we decrypt and re-encrypt our files, what's called as rekeying. Okay. Uh, and, and S3 access and policies, again, we have these concept of, of, of what are called as stages to load data, and, and of course, where we store our own customer data, and we had to separate customer data from, one customer's data from another, um, and so each customer has its own set of access policies that are managed um, at a logical level, right? So we implemented a lot of features after SIGMOD. Uh, we did this thing called data sharing, which again, you can think of as a metadata feature where I can say that CMU, CS department, or this class is a customer of ours and wants to share data with say another class that they're, they're, that also a Snowflake customer. And all we really have to do is say this, this data is really available to this as part of some metadata and access control, right? And, and, and the rest kind of just works. Uh, we added an ingestion service that, is, um, that doesn't require you to provision compute up front. You just send us the data or you just put the data in S3 and we will see it and we will just ingest it. Um, I talked about the Spark connector, support for Azure Cloud. This, I'm just scratching the surface. Jackie worked on what's called as reclustering, which he's going to talk about tomorrow, which is um, approximate sorting of large amounts of data. Uh, and there, there are at least a dozen more features that I'm kind of missing here. Jackie, you want to mention something? Uh, <laughs> um, lessons learned. Uh, it, uh, it was controversial to build a database that was not Hadoop-based, but this multi-cluster architecture really worked for us. The semi-structured extensions were also much better than we thought in terms of value. Uh, um, service was much harder than the database itself. Everybody loves the no-tuning aspect. So you guys are in the right direction there, for sure. Um, and the actual performance of the database, whether, oh my gosh, you're actually slower than this other database, didn't matter as much. So when, when you had us, you, while we didn't ever want to lose on performance, it turned out that a lot of these other things 
mattered more. And in fact, today, if you come to us and say, this little feature, if this little trick that we can do can improve performance by 20%, we probably won't take it. And we'll probably be biased in favor of a new feature. Um, ongoing challenges. Uh, so I'll leave this at that. We can talk more about this later. There's still a lot more work to do. There is no doubt about that. Um, and these are some of the things that we're kind of looking at and we're doing right now. Um, we need to go global as a, as a service. Uh, we will do replication of our services. We will have various kinds of advisors for materialized view, for clustering of data, or um, for uh, determining how well their workload is running, kind of some of the stuff that you guys are also doing right now. Uh, the, the advisors mean sort of like self-driving? The, um, some, that's kind of to be determined. I wouldn't say I'd go as far as self-driving, but um, because what your definition of self-driving is, is probably a little different from what I would say is self-driving. More database, more self-tuning. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the approach is maybe a little different here, but I think the outcome is kind of the same. And it's not like we're not uh, against new approaches. We, we have to try, we have to see them. And so we're interested in hearing more new approaches as well. I think that was my last slide. Um, I think you guys kind of know who we are. We have a second office that's now in Seattle. Um, we're 80 plus engineers. Um, Is Waffle Day still on Fridays? Wednesdays. Wednesdays. <laughs> All right, let's thank you. Cheers. Thank you, guys. All right, we have time for one question. I'll ask it. All right, so you talked about all the things you glad you, you were happy you did when you guys first started. Like from the ground up, you added security, right? Is there anything that you regret doing? That you, like this turned out to be a waste of our time. This turned out to be a big engineering time sink for us. Like, well, is there anything that you guys said in the beginning you thought this was a good idea, and then now? Yeah. So there's a. All again, you wouldn't start with that. This is the picking Java for the cloud services okay. was was in the long term has been very painful, and and I'll tell you why is because when you get, when you had to quick compile queries and the way and how uh, our compiler is kind of built, it, it does a fair amount of work. And it's fairly complex and it takes a lot of resources. And provisioning for those resources and separating those set of resources is much harder. And it's, 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 it's a lot less deterministic on how they will end up being how much memory will you end up use, using for this compilation of this query? It's very hard to tell, right, by just looking at the text of the query. Uh, and this service, uh, this part of the service ended up being multi-tenant, right? And, and, and Java as a programming language, does, it makes it mu even harder for you to know where your memory has gone, right? Is it this query, is it this query, is it that query, right? Uh, unless you sort of have added that kind of uh, you know, accounting at, from day one, it's much harder to do now. And that's where we are. So we've had to sort of turn around and do a whole lot of other things for that. Okay, uh, although most of the kids laughed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'd say real quick, Snowflake is hiring. For those of you that are, most of you are going away for the summer for internships. If you're interested in talking with Snowflake, interviewing there, you should do it while you're out there. She's just happy to take you out uh, Cheers. for a good time. So um, is Jackie. And Jackie as well. <laughs> okay. Although all those kids probably will be here. I know they're looking for jobs and they just left, so. <laughs> 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 all, right. all right, guys. We're this the end of the semester. Uh, I, again, the code reviews are due two days from now. I mean, I'll send a reminder on Piazza. Good luck with the rest of your finals. Uh, and then I'll see everyone again on uh, May 14th in this room, not where they tell us to be, in this room, 
Uh, and we'll have database t-shirts and, and bagels and breakfast for everyone, okay? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip-hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker. Rhymes I create, rotate, add a wave. Too quick to duplicate, fill a breeze, have a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. Then I'm in flight. Then we ignite, blood starts to boil I heat up the party for you, let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burns for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with same eyes